viewers welcome to interactions you're watching interaction season 2 today i have a wonderful guest with me to tell you about her she is a financial sustainability social impact social entrepreneur advisor she has trained mentored over 3000 ngos across the globe presently she is empaneled as national society development advisor for the international federation of red cross and red crescent societies also she is a symbol of women empowerment and she has got a great heart to share god's word wherever she goes she is none other than alice prema andrew alice thank you very much for being part of interactions we are so happy to have you here with us today uh, let me start with a question um, i have heard and i've seen seen you traveling a lot and recently uh, i know that you've been to geneva i think you you've been there for almost uh, more than 6 months right and uh, so my question to you is uh, do you love travel or is that your job that makes you to do that yeah uh, thank you that's very interesting question i am passionate about travel for the reason i feel that my it really expands my thinking it it make it challenges me and it, you know it makes me to sort of look at life for issues from from a very broader perspective so you know i i've always been passionate about travel from a very young age so i used to pray that god would you know as soon as i accepted christ one of my prayers was like uh, lord give me a chance to to travel because it started off with a vision i remember i saw a vision of so many flags uh, one day while i was praying so i kind of knew that god actually had put that desire in my heart mm -hmm. and uh, it did take very long i think from my early 20s mm -hmm. uh, i started traveling uh, and oh. god pays for the travel <laughs> so okay wonderful to know see uh, there are many people definitely they would know you but uh, for our audience sake would you like to share uh, something about your childhood uh, how do you how do you grow up where did you study your schooling your college okay i know you are your your uh, alumni of wcc right like yourself <laughs> like yeah you and i okay okay yes yeah, so can okay. you yeah sure so uh, i i come from a very uh, typical uh, middle class or possibly slightly upper middle class home and uh, my parents were professionals they were both academicians they were teachers my mm -hmm. father was like a trader mm -hmm. so well, my dad was a very godly man so he 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 was a great influence in my life mm -hmm. my sister led me to christ mm -hmm. so interestingly we continue to work together we do a global ministry together called symphony oh, uh symphony. yes okay. so i i consider my dad my teacher my pastor in many ways he was a good friend and uh, he Your gave dad me the pastor uh he no no he he was a trainer he, okay. Okay. so he studied in iim amdabad he was he, he was uh, a management consultant mm -hmm. but uh, the good thing is he gave me the kind of desire to think big mm -hmm. think beyond our natural abilities and capacities and financial limitations mm -hmm. so he put the god factor in me he never uh, communicated that he alone was my provider though he was a very responsible father mm -hmm. whenever my dreams were big i always found my dad asking me or challenging me to look up to a heavenly father Wonderful. so uh, you know i think that the whole idea of not being limited by my thinking where i grew up in trichy uh, it, it you know it wasn't a common thing to imagine that you will be traveling and doing a sort of global assignments I but i think the desire came from god and i think the the desire was encouraged by my dad and i owe a lot to him uh, my mother was like a typical mother with uh, she was always particular about caution and she was like why don't you take up a secure job and stay in one place mm -hmm. but uh, i i think uh, that's how i grew up and uh, i moved to delhi Im immediately after my uh, graduation and post graduation i studied in uh, madras so you did your schooling uh, in trichy then i moved to chennai for for all my studies i studied in wcc madras university madras school of social work mm -hmm. so all, all that kind of a base here then god told me very clearly to to leave my father's house as it were mm -hmm. so it was very difficult for me you know when when that word came to me very powerfully uh, and i at very early in my 20s i shifted to to delhi i was there for a good long time mm -hmm. and i think that sort of uh, gave me a very good uh, 
sort of a foundation to travel mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, exposed me to so many experiences. Mm -hmm. And from out of Delhi, I used to make a lot of travel and all my assignments, you know, God was like uh, uh, giving me jobs and promotions, which was definitely beyond my qualification. Mm -hmm. At every point, I found that I was actually with people who were probably more well-read mm -hmm. and more qualified than I. But I could definitely see the hand of God and I could see that, you know, in a lot of places God was probably positioning me for my wisdom rather than my knowledge or my qualification. And uh, I have I have no doubts that, you know, God really kind of uh, was instrumental in a lot of uh, my growth, my career growth. And of course, when I got married and I took a voluntary kind of uh, willful desire not to get into a sort of a full time job, mm -hmm. though in between my my you know post marriage i did take small assignments like this but even through it i was never there was never a free moment god made sure that i was into some consultancy or some research project or something see i felt like that you know uh, god was keeping me mentally sort of agile so even this geneva trip was something just totally unanticipated mm -hmm. it just came out of the blue when i said lord i think my children are growing up uh, do you think, you know, I'm ready for, uh, you know, some, something bigger than what I'm doing? And uh, God really orchestrated this whole thing. So, I, like you see, uh, I, I found like even from a very young age, finance was something which I was very, very uh, keen about. Mm -hmm. I suppose maybe because of a middle class upbringing, you know, by 15th, you know, all this, you know, my dad was in a regular job. So by 15th, you know, then the salary runs out. So anything right. you want, you have to wait for the next uh, First week. Yeah. So, you know, I really detested that. Mm -hmm. So in my house, we were told not to say, uh, you know, we don't have, uh, we were, my dad was very particular about saying that, you know, I don't have, mm -hmm. not for a minute, he said, I don't have money. I'm sure he struggled bringing all four of us with a single income. But all the time he said, uh, wait for six months. So that was the mm -hmm. standard response he would give whenever I wanted something. I love to travel. And once dad said, you know, I don't think I can afford to take to, you to many places. So that time, six months. six months is like by the six month, I will forget about, you know, it's like a, a delayed gratification. So I think that really helps when I teach finance. I say, you know, delaying your gratification is one of the ways you can financially become uh, more free. So not after a month or not after. So by, by the third month, fourth month, you know, that interest yes. is gone. So, okay. I mean, you know, he, he was not a harsh dad, but, you know, he he put that in me that, you know, I mean, he, it, 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 it automatically sort of made me think mm -hmm. I don't need to. I do. I shouldn't be asking dad for my big dreams. He, he may encourage my dreams, but he probably cannot afford to fund my dreams, you know. Mm -hmm. So but then I found it very early that, you know, uh, uh, God is capable of doing that, you know, bringing some uh, possibilities and assignments. Uh, you know, I, I think I was 21, 22 when I first uh, uh, travel overseas and I, I, you know, I just looked at the ticket and I said, wow, this is almost like my dad's uh, three months salary and God is giving me that, you know. So I said, OK. And uh, I, I never uh, felt bad that, uh, you know, he couldn't take me on those travels as such. But I definitely am grateful because, you know, he put the seeds and the interest to think big. And God funded those dreams. So that Thank is fine. Thank you for sharing uh, about your family, especially about your dad. It was nice listening to you, especially about your family and your dad, especially about the term, uh, the smart answer which your dad has given to you all. Uh, that is six months. I like it. And I think we all will follow <laughs> that too. With your children. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So um, now that like we have got to know about how did you grow up, about your schooling, I want to know because since you're from WCC, alumni of WCC, I want to know like any unforgettable moment yeah, uh, yeah. happened in yes, WCC. Yes, yes, it, it was a big transition. I moved from Tirchi or Trichy to, uh, to Chennai. Yeah. So I was in the hostel. So it, it, it was quite a, a change, a cultural change in some ways. I mean, I, I really prayed about it and I felt the Lord wanted me to leave mm -hmm. Trichy and move. So at every step, I, I felt like God was like, uh, egging me on, moving. Mm -hmm. So um, I was uh, happy and maybe uh, the unforgettable is when I was ele ele elected as the general secretary in the oh. Senate. Oh, so 
I mean, I think being the Senate was considered a little bit sort of a prestigious, prestigious position. position. Right. So not for the prestige, I was quite surprised that, you know, that uh, I sort of, uh, uh, or rather God enabled me to, to stand and sort of uh, win the election. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was quite a big moment. I remember in canteen when in a, it was announced and wonderful. You know, so with that came uh, a lot of more, more than uh, these incidents, I would say it really kind of uh, exposed me into psychology, systematic understanding of psychology. Uh, I had very good professors interact with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were people from all walks of life. And that for me was like a big eye opener because where I grew up, uh, you know, there were no differences between the peon and the managing director or the managers. We all studied in a school. Mm -hmm. We were not very conscious of uh, the differences. But I found like in WCC, there was this clear cut difference between people who came from this culture. <laughs> and that took a while for me to kind of uh, accept and integrate into. But uh, it gave me a lot of time to walk and to think, to reflect, to talk to people. And of course, to spend more time in prayer, reading books. I used, I used to love going to the library and I loved interacting with my professors. So, I mean, those are good. Wonderful, uh, beautiful memories. Yeah, yeah, staying alone in the hostel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good to know. So, Alice, uh, you are an expert on non-profit organizations. Uh, how would functions? In fact, uh, you give uh, trainings to NGOs in Asia, Europe and USA. How important is NGO for any nation, especially in India? Yeah. See, so more and more, uh, when you say non-profits, it's like uh, service organizations. So, you know, I was always particular about get entering into the service service industry rather than, not service industry, non-profit charities, rather than a corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, though I was like qualified to do HR and personal management and all that. Uh, I like uh, when I started then, it was like a separate industry where, you know, you have NGOs going and working with you know, on developmental issues, social development, helping people uh, come out of poverty and things like that. But now, uh, when I look back, I can see why God has really taken me through this journey. Mm -hmm. I find like everything is integrated. Even big corporates are looking about uh, thinking of responsible Correct. businesses, social right? Response. Social responsibility. Right. Uh, so they, they need to show themselves as you're not just concerned over, you know, their profits. Well, yeah. So there's this triple bottom line about people, planet, Correct profit Correct. so it's, it's a very integrated thing so it's it's not like you know a separate kind of a, a, an industry where you work i find like through the years more and more people who are highly qualified uh, who who were holding very big responsibilities in the corporate se sector gravitate towards uh, the service industry very so by service i also mean like i work with educational institutions hospitals and churches also anybody who's in the business of improving the lot of the society. I wouldn't say just the poor, but anybody improving the standards of the society comes under the non-profit. So, see, uh, non-profits play a very, very big role in sort of, you know, so social responsibility and sort of empowering people, right. you know, removing, uh, removing the class differences, the Correct. poverty and all that kind of yes. a thing. So, uh, uh, when, when I, I find like, my work with non-profits largely is around the financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about financial sustainability, a lot of uh, organizations which do service, mm -hmm. like, you know, originally we had a lot of missionaries who came in, right, who okay. introduced health yes. and education and all that. So they abolished sati, the class differences, women's empowerment, so on and so forth. So a lot of them are not able to sustain or run or pay the salaries. Mm. So what happens is they have a big vision with which they start. Mm. After some time, the vision does not sustain them mm. through the journey. So somebody very charismatic comes and starts up a, a church or educational institution mm. or a, a health institution or, or a developmental community development organization. Mm. And they're not able to continue because of lack of finances. So the, the space that I fell in, I, f I found that because from very young, I was very interested in financial sustainability, not just for organizations, but even for individuals. Mm -hmm. So that's where kind of, you know, I find organizations function like individuals. If they don't have, get their act together, you know, how big their vision is, how much they want to help people or to serve humanity, they cannot 
continue that path. So that is the work I do. And when you talk about financial sustainability, you are also talking about programs. Are you giving programs which are relevant to people? You don't want five or six different organizations doing the same thing in the same place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so all that is related. So that is how my, my engagement with the uh, with, with nonprofits have evolved over the years to help them to become financially strong and sustainable. By sustainability, I mean not just for now, but also think for ongoing future kind of a needs. So that is how uh, I got into the sector. So, and one thing led to another because I work with bigger international nonprofits, right. which at a given point of time, they're called funding agencies. They fund a lot of non-government organizations or CBOs, right. so, which is called community-based organizations. So then yeah, I moved into working with their headquarters, moving to different places. And, uh, and a lot of nonprofits not just have programs, but they also have assets. So they have buildings, they have uh, income generation programs, they have bakeries, they have schools, they have petrol pumps. So then uh, I moved into how do they do responsible business, okay. profitable business. Now, you know, in the name of serving the poor, they shouldn't forget uh, finances, right? Profit making. Correct. So how do you make integrate profit into your business? So that's where my social entrepreneurship uh, interest evolved. So I, I started helping businesses to, to be more impactful. I mean, non-profit businesses to be more impact, impactful, uh, giving them more business skills, business development skills, branding skills, communication skills. So, so that is how I got into the space. And so you've been uh, training uh, the NGOs around the world, right? Yes, I, I, uh, yes I, I, I work with the non-profits, charities, uh, educational institutions around the world, yes. Okay, so really good to know. I think people who really want to start an NGO are like, how can we, uh, as you said, pro um, pro uh, financial sustainability and uh, how can we serve people? So everything, we have to put everything together and we have to plan accordingly, right? Yeah. So I think your answer, I think it will be helpful for our viewers. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So what is the relevance of your work to Indian context? In, in, in the Indian context, I think more and more we, uh, we systematically conduct a lot of workshops. I do a lot of workshops uh, educating people to, to raise awareness about the work they do mm -hmm. in the context they, they live and get people around uh, to support them, to engage with them so that they're more sustainable. So they don't have to look outside for support. Somebody living uh, thousands of miles away doesn't have to support the cause that you you, you are uh, working for. Somebody around you, especially in a country like India, where there's like a growing, thriving middle class, you know, who are capable of buying, uh, you know, the kind of investments, the cars and the mall and everything you go, there's, there's so much. The purchasing power of people in India, the middle class and the upper middle class is very high. So mobilizing and raising support internally is, is, a, is a more sustainable way, uh, uh, is, is, is something which, uh, makes this whole financial sustainability and uh, social uh, strategic philanthropy mm -hmm. more relevant. So there are, we have something called the Ministry Fundraising Network, where we engage with churches, with your nonprofits to, to up their skills of getting indigenous support, local yeah. support, mm -hmm. mobilize resources locally, so that they can continue the good work they are doing. Okay, so you teach financial sustainability, right? How important is finance to any organization? How should we handle it? Yeah, so when you're talking about finance, finance is as important to an organization as it is to an individual. Correct. So organizations is made of individuals, right? Yes. Fundamentally, you need money to, to buy things for purchases, right? For day-to-day -day purchases yes. or payments or salaries and things like that. So you, you cannot run an institution without uh, people. So that is a very fundamental level at which you need money. So then money is the currency of the world. So through money, you have the power to influence, mm -hmm. right? So if you take a movie, for example, or let's say you, you do a big event mm -hmm. as a nonprofit. So then there, is, there, are, there are ways you can impactfully communicate something. You know, yes. sometimes, you know, you can have a documentary or some story that you're telling it in a way people will be interested in. Mm -hmm. So you are actually sort of using money for doing that. It took mm -hmm. money for me to come here, right? Yes. So money is, 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 is like a, a, for buying provisions. It is very important for promoting your vision, right? Yes. So if, if an organization, every, 
Non-profit is founded on a vision. There's a founder who has the vision. Correct. So if you want to execute your vision, you be it a church or a school or you need money to to promote your vision, right? Okay. So broaden yes. your experiences. Yes. So and to influence, like essentially, these are the three things: your power to influence, your purchasing power, and your ability to actually sort of you know promote your vision. Money is very very central to 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 individuals as well as to institutions. Wonderful. I think you have really answered it very clearly and crisply. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, seriously. So you work with both secular organizations mm -hmm. and churches, right? Mm -hmm. So how different are they in mm -hmm. financial aspect? Yeah, that's a very broad question. But <laughs> from my observation, I can see like, you know, if you were, you're talking about the secular, secular and sacred or spiritual you're saying right correct so my my understanding is secular organizations are more organized more systematic <laughs> more pragmatic they have better systems because I, i'm part of a ministry fundraising network and uh, for the past five years or so I've been systematically working with a lot of church-based organizations mm. i find uh, we are more driven by passion and the great commission as we say but we don't put our act together in terms of basic requirements for running an organization. You know, running a family requires certain systems, budgeting, uh, uh, you, you know, incomes, investments. Mm -hmm. When you talk about that, I don't fi I, I find that the, the founder wants to do the finances, uh, the founder wants to do this, the, the, the development work. There's no specialization of work. Everybody, one person is rolled into multiple roles, uh, lack of systems, lack of staff, lack of skills, I would say, uh, la lack of strategic direction or a vision for what you want to do five years from now. Mm -hmm. So these are some things which I find uh, failing in, in, in uh, most of the smaller uh, spiritual organizations. Okay. And uh, I think they don't want to even talk about the word finance or even ask for help. But whereas in the secular space, I find people actually are willing to go and say, how can I put my house in order? How do I build an institution which can survive over uh, long periods of time? I mean, like for COVID, for example, was a very uh, simple case where I found like so many spiritual pastors or people knocking at my door, uh, asking for money. No, not one of them wanted to know, teach us the skills to become sustainable. The same time during COVID, I had a lot of secular organizations hiring me to teach them skills. So do you see the perspective, the difference? So we want simple solutions, but they want long-term solution. And that is sustainability. Thinking long-term is what uh, I find more, uh, I, I can't say all secular organizations, most of them so that I've been- So we pre-plan, organize. Organize, want systems, want to learn, up, upgrade your skills, ask yeah. for support, ask for help, be willing to pay for it. Yeah. Everything doesn't come on volunteering. So, yeah. you know, so I mean, those are some stark realities that I say, you know, I think a lot of Christian organizations are so used to receiving mm -hmm. that they don't want to give to, mm -hmm. to acquire, uh, you know, and plus they're more insulated. So this is something which we found more Christian organizations are vulnerable mm -hmm. and because they don't anticipate the problems that are coming, right? So then they, when, when something happens, they don't know how to handle it. And they lack resilience. Once once something like a COVID or some crisis or a, you know, hits, they don't know how to get out of it because they are not prepared for it. I think um, you were to the point and um, um, people who are watching, especially Christian organizations, I think uh, it will definitely help them. I don't mean uh, to put the Christian organization down. Let me clarify. Yes. We have a message which can really radically transform the society. Correct. For betterment. For, yes. I mean, that's a call to make this world a better place. That's yes. the call of every Christian. But if you don't have the means and the methods and the structure and the systems, Correct. you can only work this far. You can't expand and, you know, uh, expand your territory or your boundaries. So that is where I come from, you know, with, with a lot of concern and Understood. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a brilliant answer. Thank you. <laughs> How to overcome debt, both as an individual and as an organization? Okay. So debt from individual, 
yeah, yeah. So, uh, both as an individual and as an organization yeah that, that is more pronounced in the individual i mean you know uh, when uh, not many institutions get into debt as such because you know if they go and approach uh, uh, organize you know for credit or something mm -hmm. the banks would have done a thorough checkup and they won't even give them a loan unless they are ready to repay Correct. so i mean let's come come to start at the personal level so debt is like a modern man slavery i would say mm -hmm. so so de debt is basically an indication that you know the three things one is you, you, that you lack the wisdom mm -hmm. right so you don't know how, how to sort of anticipate like i told you a lot of organizations don't have the wisdom to anticipate to plan strategy thinking ahead uh, so that is one the other thing is uh, debt always is an indication that you're not in the favor of god right you're probably led by your instincts. I spoke about the six month delayed gratification, okay. right? Yeah. They don't want to postpone. You know, recently I was talking to one of my uh, lawyers. He was talking about a lot of Christian organizations. Mm -hmm. They just have, you know, big uh, assets. So they buy a big car or they buy a lot of uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. they, but they look very rich and growing. The minute they start growing, they start investing in all these, uh, you know, dead assets, as it were. But then suddenly, they you know they come crashing down. So he said, a lot of them are you know in, into debts. They are not able to pay. They're into personal loans and things like that. So debt is basically not being in the right favor uh, favor zone. Mm -hmm. And the other fundamental reason people get into debt is because they don't have the knowledge of how the world works. Actually, you know, debt, for example, you know, credit card, for example, yeah. is, is 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 a debt which is uh, which is choking a lot of people Correct. and then you know you don't have the knowledge like yes. for, for example you know a person doesn't know yeah. if you if, you, if you're getting into a debt you, you're actually limiting you, you're, you're getting into depression you're get, getting into sort of you know your family is put to shame debt is like a quicksand yes. and it, it's, it's also debt is a clear violation of God's commandment mm -hmm. that you know you, you should always be a lender and not a borrower and oh no man Yes. Any debt. So when God clearly says there are certain principles, it just means they don't have less knowledge of the scriptures, less stewardship, and also less knowledge of how the world works if they get into a debt. So there are easy ways to come out of debt also if you ask for help. And most of the time, people who take debt, they want to run undercover, hide themselves, and then, you know, end up losing more and more, and then, you know, getting into greater and greater mess. Yeah. So, so that is how debts are. Uh, they they completely bring you down under, and uh, you know shrink your territory. Doesn't allow you to fulfill your plan and purpose. For you, you're not in an abundant place actually. Yeah, points taken. I think uh, people who are watching interactions, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be really wise mm -hmm. um, in taking financial decisions. Mm -hmm.